when I started as an entrepreneur, I wanted to take advantage of every opportunity, win every battle, you know, understanding who you are, how you show up and how, how you communicate and how it impacts other people is really important because intentions can be pure, but the optics can, can really get muddy. Life and work are no longer separate. They are ingrained. And, and that's the reality anyways, whether you choose to face that or not, right? Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast, where I bring you the best and the brightest in the world of business entrepreneurship, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Folks, I have a great one today, and this one taps into my roots. Real quick, my first job was with a little company called Vitamin Water, so I'm very uh, uh, astute to the to the beverage world and one of my biggest regrets in business, and we'll get to that in a little bit because I'd probably be a lot richer man if I stayed along with that, but let's get to it. My guest today is Chris Hunter, a leader in the beverage industry, and you probably heard of his iconic Four Local Beverage, which he founded with a bunch of his friends from college. We'll get into that. Most recently, the founder of Health Focus, Koya, and the unique Not Your Father's Root Beer, and Chris has cemented his status as a visionary in the field. At Koya, Chris has led the company to an astounding $100 million in sales every year with their plant-based protein shakes and appearing in Whole Foods, Sprouts, 7-Eleven, and most recently, a little company called Starbucks. And he's got a new book out. We're going to get into that and a whole lot more. Chris Hunter, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks for having me, man. So <laughs> we, we were joking off camera. I mean, obviously, when I get reached out to a bunch of you know PR companies and I saw Four Loco, it jumped out at me. We're roughly the same age. Reminds me of college. But most people don't know the story. They know what they've heard in the press. They know about the reformulation and all the shit they heard in the news. But what a lot of folks don't know is the story and the story behind it. But my first question, Chris, going back to like even like like high school, right? Did you did you kind of always have that entrepreneurial bug? Were you the type of kid with the lemonade stand and the paper route? Always. Yeah. And, and when I think back about that, I was like the entrepreneur. I didn't even know the word. Right. But entrepreneurial no. kind of mentality was ingrained in me. And, and it's interesting because I come from Youngstown, Ohio. It's a you know lower middle class, blue collar, steel mill, automotive town. And uh, my mom actually was a, a hairstylist. And my stepdad had set up a shop in our basement. And I never thought about it until I started thinking about the book. And I'm like, that probably ingrained some entrepreneurial roots in me. I saw my mom do her mm -hmm. own thing. Um, so I, you know, I sold coloring book pictures. Uh, you know, somebody made the mistake of telling me that I colored well, and I said, all right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go sell these then. And uh, Started buying bowl candy and selling it on the bus. All the typical stuff, right? Uh, yeah. You know, most of it legal. Dabbled in some of the illegal things later in life as well. But, oh, yeah. We all have our college years, right? That's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> that's for another podcast, Chris. Yeah, we'll save it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting, too, and, and we don't really talk about it enough, like the word entrepreneurship and when it became popular, like popularized and, and what it was. But think about the OG entrepreneurs, like your mom. And I kind of say also, like, small business owner and entrepreneur are kind of synonymous, right? Like it kind of morphed into that too. Like small business owners, when you look at the definition, those are the real OG entrepreneurs. Look at your mom, look at, you know, she had her own business and she had to do two things at once for any, any entrepreneur. It's, it's biz dev and delivery, right? Delivering yeah. on your product. And she did that, right? Like she had to build clients. What do you, do you remember like early on, like what'd you, what'd you learn from her as far as like, you know, that, that, entrepreneurship kind of drive i mean this this is like pre-third grade so i was probably like what seven eight years old and i don't i don't know that i um crystallize any like learnings from her then but now i look back and i'm like i think it was just the the idea that you could kind of do your own thing because everybody else in in youngstown was really trying to get a job at general motors or work yeah. in steel mills you know and so watching her do her own thing and and develop a skill she went to trade school and 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 kind of uh, be able to make some money and a living off of that was, was pretty cool. Now she ended up trading that in for the ideal, you know, work at a factory, get good benefits, uh, career, but I see her now and it's still a skill that she has, um, and something that she can always kind of earn, but she's moved with us. We, we lived in Chicago for a while. She moved there. She moved up to California with us. She moved down to Miami with us. And so, you know, there's always that ability sure. to, to create a, an income if you want. And so she's had a she's had a front row seat to watch her boy shine over here. That must be exciting. She must be a proud mama. Yeah, yeah. It's well, you know what's really interesting is uh, my mom struggled with addiction for years, and through the program, she she's in AA meetings uh, mm -hmm. often, you know, daily. And there was this weird 
proud mom moment of, of things I've created. And also like, holy shit, there's people in these meetings talking about how they realize, you know, they had a problem and they talk about drinking four loco or something. So it's a weird, you know, yeah. it's, it's weird to create in the world. Do like, my son do? Did my son do that? <laughs> no, I mean, it could, but it, but it could have been anything at the time. Listen, addicts are are addicted to anything. It's just a matter right. of delivery vehicle. So I want I want I want to park that and bring everyone uh, into the into the story here. So college is interesting, right? College is an interesting time, and and for me, it was it was entrepreneurship. Listen, I sold a few things here and there in college. You had to get by. Yeah, you had to scrap it up. And I was in a fraternity as well. And I think fraternities are interesting because, especially in my case, and I'd love to obviously hear your story. We were fundraising. We were thinking about throwing parties. How do we raise money for this? So your mind is working. Plus, you're in school and you're taking, you know, business type classes and, and learning how to do that. But for Loco, right? Let's let's get into that story. What happened in that basement with your buddies? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's see. Go back to that time. So I learned what what nightclub promoting was in college, right? And, and I didn't grow up in New York. I grew up in Ohio, right? So we were a little bit behind getting some of these things. But I remember this this one guy used to always invite me down to this nightclub in, in Columbus and he'd say, hey, come, I have a little party, come to the VIP, whatever, right? Uh, bench that for a minute. I, I heard that I could get this job working for the spring break company down in Cancun. And I was like, <laughs> this is the best job ever. I'm taking the quarter off, I'm going, right? While I'm down there in this job, I'm, I'm counting, I'm at the door of a nightclub counting people that come in with the brace on and I'm, and I yep. ask, why am I doing this? So a big thing I think you could agree with this is just being curious, right? Cause I could have just mm -hmm. sat there and clicked and said, give me my check. Why are we doing this? And I learned they were getting paid for every person that walked through the door with that wristband on. Yep. And it dawned on me, Oh, that, that buddy who always invited me to the nightclub, he was getting paid. So when I moved back to Columbus, I started a nightclub promotions business. It, it oddly became fusion projects, which is the name of, of four logos parent company. My point in that story as it leads to Four Loco is I learned about promoting and about asking questions. And because I had made many of those contacts, um, there was a guy who had started a vodka company and he was in town in Ohio. And Ohio has some weird liquor laws. And so this broker, this, this woman that I knew, she was used to calling on white tablecloth accounts. But she mm -hmm. told me, she said, this, this guy is trying to sell his product to nightclubs and party bars. And I don't know any of them. You do. Can you take mm -hmm. this guy around and introduce him to the owners? And I didn't know why I was doing it, but I figured, hey, why not? It'll give, it'll be a good experience, kind of like an internship, right? Mm -hmm. And and I just watched and listened as he pitched this product. And so that was one seed planted. I was learning a little bit about the alcohol industry. The other, but you're also seeing the the, the 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 curiosity led to asking how and the business behind it. And like, wait a minute, connect the dots. The light bulb went off, and you started connecting the dots of how shit happens and how money's made. Exactly. And, and it's just asking the question, right? Everyone's happy to tell you. I mean, people love to talk about themselves, right? So they're happy to tell you what they're doing or how they're doing it. So that, that was one thing kind of bench that I always knew that my network was really valuable as I was creating one. And so back in that day, it was, you know, business cards. So I just had a stack of them. Every one I got, I kept, I didn't know why. Just Rubber banded up. That's right. A little, a little <laughs> I got, I have them all. I have them all in boxes, man. Right. Right. <laughs> and so, so I kept that right. Keep that aside. Uh, at that time, Red Bull was also launching in the yep. U.S., right? And it wasn't in Columbus. It was down in Miami. It was in New York. It was in like the, the major markets. I remember. Um, but we found this little Thai store downtown that had the original concentrated bottles of Red Bull. So people Jeez. knew about it, but they couldn't get it. So we went and bought that in bulk and started selling it at the fraternity parties. And so this mm. idea of, you know, caffeine and alcohol was was clearly born. And um Fast forward, I, I moved to Chicago. I have no job. I've done these entrepreneurial things. I, I believe that I'm uh, too tenured, I guess, naively to, to take a normal nine to five job in a corporate world. But at some point I was like, I got to make some damn money. And so mm -hmm. I started leafing through my old cards. And I, I found that guy that I led around in Chicago or in uh, Columbus. And he was in Chicago. I bugged the hell out of him until he gave me a job in the alcohol industry. The point was, College seeded the idea, right? Uh, there's a market here of alcohol and caffeine. There's some context that I have. And just that uh, being in my brain kind of helped crystallize, oh, we could we could do this. It's not this completely unattainable thing, you know? I mean, you look back on it now, I mean, the influx of beverage brands. I mean, we've seen such a spike over the last 10, 15 years. What, what is it? I know how hard it is to make, to break it, but why is it, why do people think that it's, it's a, a crazy unique idea and they're just going to be wildly successful. I don't know. It seems easy. I remember in that company when the president of the company came in town and they told me to take him around Chicago when I was pitching vodka and I was taking this guy to all the tough accounts that I couldn't crack and he did no better than me. 
And it dawned on me and I was like, I was like, what does this guy even do? Like, he doesn't know. Mm. Now, now being the ex- executive, like I understand there's a whole different level of work, but the na- naive approach of like, look, I'm not doing the work. I can do this made me think, well, I can just create a beverage too. So maybe it's, it, it ultimately looks easy as you know, like everything seems like an overnight success. And when you learn about it, it's 10 years in the making and you don't oh, yeah. know the ups and downs along the way. Yeah, I mean, I worked my, my first job out of school. I was working for 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 Vitamin Water, Smart Water, and I got a real inside peek. I mean, the fu- I mean, they had tremendous funding yeah. before they got bought out, and going into form everything from formulation, packaging, branding, marketing, uh, FDA approvals. Like people don't realize how much that costs. Yeah. It's not just making batches in your – listen, people do that at, you know, at uh, you know, farmer's markets and they're making their own stuff and selling on the side. But to be a licensed product that you could sell and retail to the public, there's a tremendous journey and investment that goes into it. And you have to be prepared for that. I mean you really have to be something special. Um, I mean even now like the, the CBD, THC infused, what's, what's your take on, on a lot of those products coming out? Um, I, I mean, the CBD thing was interesting, but I think it was a little bit too uh, ingredient focused. And, and so, mm. less, you know, that whole industry kind of like at the mercy of when this government regulation was going to happen or if it was, um, you know, the cannabis space, I think is really interesting, though. I, I was reading a stat recently that talked about dry Januaries and there's more mm-hmm. people participating in dry Januaries than ever. But the interesting fact was it doesn't mean they're not consuming some state altering substance. I think it's called California sober these days. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and so the rise of, um, of THC beverages, I'm, I'm bullish on, I mean, look, I, I'm a light THC consumer. I get, I get paranoid, but I'm advising and investing in a drink called Drippy, yeah. which is a THC beverage. So I think there's a real opportunity. It's just going to take time. Yeah. And, and, and I think that just the, the general consensus and the deregulation uh, across the states is making it a lot easier. So going back to the early days of, of, of fusion projects, what was what was one of those, you know, tough lessons learned the hard way? Like the first time you guys really got punched in the face like and, and, and set in your place, right? Like, yeah, there were there's so many times getting punched in the face. I think the one that stands out when you just said that is like we had this we had this false security that we were doing well because we were selling into distributors. And so there was revenue coming in, right? So the alcohol industry is highly regulated. It's a three-tier system. We were considered the suppliers. You sell into a distributor who sells in, into the licensed retailer, or that's the store or bar, right? We were selling into distributors who ultimately are our customer. Mm-hmm. We were feeling good. And then, then we realized we were just kind of kicking the can down the road if the product wasn't getting into the stores. And then if people weren't consistently buying the product off of the stores, it was a dead end, right? And so that was a real rude awakening. And we said, oh, shit, we really got to figure out a way to, to, to do something here, whether that meant build more awareness and hype about the product or ultimately what worked for us was, was innovating and, and evolving our product. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, too, and, and, and I want to get to the evolution of the product in, in a moment there, but one of the interesting points when I was doing my research, and, and something we really don't talk about, you helped create an economy and jobs, right, around the manufacturing, the distribution. That's something that people really don't think about when they're, when they're, when they're building and developing a product. I mean, you're building a company, you're building a team, you're helping people improve their livelihoods. Yeah. How, how did you manage growing as a, as a people leader in, in, in that aspect? Well, I'll tell you at the beginning, I was not good at it. Um, and, and how so, um, I, I lack of experience, probably definitely lack of experience, probably mentality. I was kind of like a get it done no matter what, no bullshit, no excuses mm-hmm. type person. And, and I think there's, that's still my mentality, but I've developed the softer skills over the years to, to help people become the best version of them, themselves in whatever role they're in. That wasn't my mentality at the beginning. Now I will say you know, you hear a lot of this entrepreneurial talk and it's very high level and it's very evolved and that's great. But when you're going from got to eat to, to building something like that shit, you don't have time for, you know? And so that's the mentality I was in is I got to eat. I got to make this company work and we just got to get it done. And in the early days, it was my, myself and my two partners were the only full-time employees. We brought on some interns and we kind of just cut them loose, go do some stuff. Mm. We ultimately had to fire them. And when we, when we started hiring employees, we hired the people that were better than us in the role that they were in. And, and the initial role was key. street sales, get out with the distributor and get it into the store. And they were teaching us how to do it. And I think that was the beginning of my kind of understanding of how important a team is. That's such an important lesson too, as, a, as an entrepreneur. And I, and I kind of related to the idea of outsourcing anybody, anything that somebody could do better, faster, cheaper, more experience where I may not need to learn that. And I caveat that because as a business owner, you really need to know, you need to be cleaning the floors you know, formulating the product, whatever. 
But there's a certain point when you hire people who are better than you because it's going to make everybody better. But I do and taking that you. ego out of it, right? I, I yes, taking ego out of it. But I do agree with you. There's something to be said about doing it yourself first, so that you understand what you're trying to hire and manage. And you can't do that with everything. I'll never be the product no. formulator. I'll never be the production manager. You know, the, those things I'm, I'm going to hire better for me from day one. I've never done them, but I've been involved in enough conversations that I can try to hold those people accountable if I need to. So let's talk about hiring for a moment here while we're on the topic here. Uh, at this stage of your of your career and your business and what you've built, by the time someone gets you in an interview process, they have the skills, they have the experience. And you're talking to them to see if they're going to be a value add to the team. How, how do you suss out you know, character, values, and they're going to be a great addition to the team. What are some of those go-to Chris Hunter questions? Yeah, there's there's two things that I learned. One was these behavioral assessments are really valuable, right? Because mm -hmm. people can interview really well. They can say all the right things. I can personally like them. And that's come back to biting the ass. So when I was at Fusion, we learned about the DISC profiles and we started using those. And, and the most eye-opening thing for me was we had someone who had passed multiple stages of interview take this DISC profile before they interviewed with me and my partners. And what it said in that profile was focus on these two or three things in the interview, because this will be the make or break components. They'll either do really well or they'll fall apart. And in this particular interview, they fell apart. So it was eye opening to me that it helped me get really laser focused on what I was asking rather than broad based bullshit, you know, hey, do we like each other type question. So you know, that's the first thing. The second thing is I'll say at this stage, I've, I've kind of learned that when you have the leader in place for that department usually they make the decision. So I totally mm. empower my team to hire who they feel is the best fit. What I try to do is align with them trust. what we're looking for. Right. You trust it. You hired the person that, that's making the decision. So trust them on, on their, on their decision-making. And you said something so interesting and I am, I, I am raising my hand. I am, I am, I am a great interviewer when I was hunting for jobs I and mean, it kind of led to the podcasting thing, but there was roles I got that I sucked at when I got in because I may not have been qualified. So it's, it's, it's not always the best person that gets a job. A lot of times it's the best interviewer and a lot of companies they get, right. It's almost like dating, right. You get kind of wooed up in those first couple of dates and exactly. then like, all right, now we're in a relationship and I'm seeing all your flaws. I'm seeing maybe you are not the, you know, the best person. And I implore my clients to do exactly what you're doing. Yes. Have that cordial conversation. You want to see their energy. You want to see their vibe. But at the end of the day, do they have those skill sets, right? Do they also have those communication skills that are you know, critical for the role that they're being hired for. So the fact that you guys have really dialed in and especially you, right, from that decision making standpoint is critical and, and I applaud you to that. So I want to get back and let's 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 wrap well, what, the, the one four. other thing I'll add to the hiring process since we're on it is Yeah, let's the other get into thing it. I've found really valuable is digging into things that you that the, the person says they've done. Right. Because I feel like everyone says, Oh, I was a part of a team that did this. I, I did that. Well, if you did that, you can really speak to the nuances of it. What happened when this? How did you do that? And if they can't answer that specifically, they're probably bullshitting a little bit and like including themselves in a, in a bigger you know, team, which is fine that they were part of a team. But I want people who are really honest about what exactly I did and here's exactly how I did it. And I would, I would encourage anyone interviewing, just be candid. Like where you haven't done it or where you had team members who supported you, that's a good answer. That's fine. That's fine. And I'm going to, I'm going to double down on this, on this topic for a moment, because I've, I've interviewed incredible leaders like yourself and I asked the same question and they all want to know the same thing. What did you do and how did you do it? And what did you, what did the team, what, what were the goals? Like what were the goals and what did you accomplish? Right. And what was your contribution to it? And Chris, you hit the nail on the head, be honest and open. That goes a long way. I mean, you'll get smoked out in two seconds on day one in the job. If you haven't done any of that shit, Yeah. like no chance. Exactly. It, 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 it won't even be that. So Obviously, there's lessons learned. And are you a believer in, in higher, slow, fire, quick? Yeah, uh, theoretically. I mean, it's easier said than done, especially when yeah. you have a role that you really need somebody in. But I, uh, I've burnt, been burnt enough times where I would rather just delay and fill that gap on my own um, or with someone from our team than hire the wrong person. Because, man, that wrong hire, as you know, can be toxic to the organization. And And I heard this saying, and I really like to try to live by it, is like, you allow whatever level of employee you allow in your your company sets the bar for what's acceptable. So if you have mm -hmm. one person who's subpar, then everyone else says, "Well, I can I can be subpar. That's okay yeah. here, right?" Yeah, that's 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 a that's a that's a really big point here, and I appreciate you sharing the, the insights here. I mean, that's that's what the show is about, and and I want everyone to really take that point to heart. I'm going to clip it up. We're going to put it out there. So, uh, getting back to the back half of the four loco story, incredible growth. 
there was an incredible cultural uh, up upswell, right? It was picked up. It was all over. People were talking about it, good, the bad. How did, how did you guys deal? There was there was a lot of negative backlash yeah. out there around the product formulation, the uh, the intention of it. There was a lot of talk around, um, you know, the 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 negativity of mixing alcohol and and caffeine. Um, how did how did how did you personally? Like from a mental health perspective, how, how did you handle it at that time of your life? Well, I, I handled it by being anchored in the reality. One, I was a consumer of caffeine and alcohol. So I had firsthand experience, right? And I, and I think we often think of in our current day and age, alcohol and caffeine is Red Bull and vodka or something like that. But think about historically, like people will go to dinner and have a couple glasses of wine and an espresso at the end, right? This is not something completely new. We're now the espresso martini movement, right? There you go, right? Yeah. I think it was like the second most uh, ordered drink last year behind the margarita. We do it with tequila, by the way. It's a game changer. Yeah, tequila, yeah, espresso. I tried that recently. It was really good. Um, so I, nice I think anchored in that reality um, made me comfortable. The second was everything we did was federally and state approved. So if there were really concerns, my thought was, why are we getting approvals up until the year of the, the whole kind of debacle that happened with us? So that was first and foremost. And, and then the, the other side of it was there are inherent dangers and risks with consuming any mind altering stuff, including alcohol. Right. And so that the re for that reason, there are laws in place called dram shop laws that protect the alcohol companies because they said, you knew what you were getting into by consuming alcohol. So that's how I felt like morally comfortable with what we had created. Do I, I hated to hear any stories of anybody having any harm or damage done to themselves of for any reason, right? But um, to assume that that is our responsibility rather than someone take personal accountability, like that's kind of mind blowing to me. So uh, our, our motto was always like, we play by the rules, right? Whatever the rules are. And the rules said that we can create this. And so we created this. Um, now, it, you know, if the rules change, we change and they did. So uh, we were unfortunately a big part of that rule changing. So. Yeah, I mean, let's take it to, to 2010 and uh, the cult following around, you know, blackout in a can, which is which leads to the the uh, the title of the book. We'll get there. I heard there was a vigil in New York and I, went, I was trying to find it on YouTube. Yeah, like there were people were like protesting that the, the, the formulation change. Yeah. Is that was, crazy to see? Like, it was cult, wild. I mean, you knew he had a cult following. It was, it was wild to see. But I mean, there was a guy named Eddie Wong who owned uh, the Bauhaus and a, and a restaurant called uh, Ji Yao in, in New York. And he he uh, recognized the hypocrisy and kind of this ruling. And so he held a free four loco party at his at his restaurant and it got raided. And, oh, like, God. To, to, the, to understand that people, the government was dedicating resources to raid a party with a federally legal product is, is mind blowing to me. Like, don't you have something better to do? Come exactly, on. exactly. And so, yeah, there, there were vigils. There were people making a run on the product. They're buying everything. Oh, they yeah. could. So there was a real passion around that that product. And there still is for the brand, which is amazing because it it ingrained itself in a specific ethos. Like even today with Four Loco not having caffeine in it, like if you drink Four Loco, you're you're making a statement. You're going to have a, a fun, you know, wild night. So, well, I mean, that was kind of cool, too. Like the idea of pivoting, too, when it went to the 24 ounce tall boy. Right. And the, and the beverage and the alcohol content was which changed a little bit, too. I mean, the idea of pivoting in a business and kind of keeping keeping the, you know, the the flow alive there. I heard I heard a, a, a pretty keep me straight on this one with the surplus old product that couldn't be sold. It was actually converted to ethanol and the cans and everything recycled. That's exactly what happened. I mean, we had a lot of demand coming in from other countries asking us to export it. And the government said, no, we couldn't export it, which was kind of mind blowing as well. It's contraband, right? Chris, contraband, <laughs> right? What the fuck? Exactly. And so, so we, we had limited options. We were, we were hung with this inventory. And so to go out and destroy it would cost a lot of money. So mm -hmm. my partner, Jeff found this, this creative alternative where we could donate it. They would convert the, the alcohol to ethanol to be used in, in cars and then recycle the cans and they wouldn't charge us anything for the destruction of that. So that a good story. saved us a few, a few million dollars. It was like 20, how many, like how yeah. many truckloads? Of it, was, it was about $20 million worth of inventory. Oh we had to my God. Imagine backing that shit up into a college party. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> just like a whole, like a fire hose. All that, 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 I mean, so one, one of the other really cool things is the, the brand extension, um, beverages, alcoholic beverages and pop culture, hip hop culture are aligned. Music culture are aligned. How did the, idea come about and the and the and the you know the the move into 
you know, the music space and eventually starting a record label. That had to be pretty cool. Yeah. So that, that was all after my time. So in two, after your time. Okay. Yeah. And in 2014, I became no longer active, uh, in managing the company. I, I'm still partners with Jason and Jeff, but they've done a great job managing the company since I, I can say that they have done a really good job, job finding ways to keep that brand very relevant to its core consumer. And I think that that move is one of them, but I wasn't a part of it. Definitely staying relevant. So let's go to 2014. And and talking about the uh, talking about the exit, um, was that was that tough for you, or were you ready to make you know at that point of your life, that point of business, you built something up to an incredible stage, you exited, you you know, you did your thing. Was that scary, exciting? What, what was that like for you, twenty fourteen? Well, so so I think the term exited is can often be confused with a financial event, and in my case, exiting the business meant that I was fired from my company by my partners, and so. As you can imagine, that is, of course, a little bit difficult to do, a lot bit difficult to mm, deal with. Doing right? for a decade. You built this. It was your baby. That's right. Uh, I will say, in retrospect, it was the best thing that could have happened. I wasn't happy in the position um, and in the company. My partners and I weren't aligned anymore. And I'm not saying they were wrong or, or, or I was wrong. It just wasn't aligned anymore. Interest evolve and change. People change. Business interest changes. Exactly. And, and if you think about this, we started this when we were 25. We were in our early 30s at that time. So life Different has changed. Um, and, and the way I look at it in retrospect is I knew what needed to be done and I didn't make it happen. And so it happened to me. And so the mm. lesson for me is like when you know you got to do something, even if it's not pleasant, you got to you got to take you know the bull by the horns and take the action or otherwise it's going to happen to you on not your terms, right? Hey, everybody. I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20-plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Well, let's sit on let's sit on that one for a minute. Let's let's dig a little bit deeper, and I want to talk about accountability because I think I don't think enough people talk about accountability. Everyone knows my story. I had my self awareness epiphany, which led to really understanding accountability and the the good and the bad and the things that happen in life. Did you, did you have an epiphany at that time, like understanding? All right, this is this is what I did. This is what I want to be doing. This is what I could be doing better in I life, business, in, in terms of how I was showing up, and and while. My intention was pure. I was showing up just with the best interest to do um, as much as possible, as fast as possible to make our company as big as possible. I was showing up uh, to my partners in a way that was was kind of polarizing, right? It would push them away. And I, that was- How so? Um, very sharp, very, uh, very fast to move. You know, when you're in a partnership or you're equal partners, you have to respect the other people's opinions and get feedback. And that, that can be a slower process. I didn't think mm. we had time for any of that shit, right? Um, and so I will take, and I, and I always do now after this, a hundred percent responsibility for my 50% of the, of the issue. Right. And so, so, you know, I, I learned how I was showing up. I ended up doing ayahuasca in Peru, which was a huge epiphany. And, and I learned how I showed up in the world, right. Broader than just the partnership. And I think understanding who you are, how you show up and how, how you communicate and how it impacts other people is really important because intentions can be pure but the optics can, can really get muddy. That's so interesting too. And, and I have a lot, I'm, 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 I'm plant medicine adjacent. A lot of my friends have, have had gone through ceremony and they've, they, I'm just, I just hate throwing up. So I'm, I'm, I'm passing on, on, <laughs> on that you. part. I, the purging is, is, listen, I'm all for being open to mind altering experiences that are going to enable you to see another perspective of yourself, be able to step outside of yourself and see how you perceive yourself. Right. And I think that's critical to, to have those moments for better or worse and explore and understand that. And I've only heard amazing things about people who have gone through the journey and it gives you an opportunity to do something. First of all, it, it takes you completely out of the moment, like a full 180 from your day-to-day -day life of running a company. Absolutely. And you're in the jungles of Peru. You're in a completely different environment. I assume that you were scared and nervous about what you were experiencing, but also excited, right? With anticipation. Did you have any preconceived notions before you went into that, into that ceremony and journey? of what you might've gotten out of it? Or did you really go through the, the, the body work and the mind work to prep into it? No, I did, I did the work prepping for it. I mean, I had a great um, kind of uh, 
person that aggregated the group, uh, he, this guy, Michael Castoris out of San Fran and, and his group was called Entrepreneur Awakening. And so he mm. curated, um, and he, and I believe he still does this, like 10 people entrepreneurs from around the world that were going to go down. And he made sure that the personalities kind of like mesh. So you were going into what would be a comfortable environment. He also provided a, a kind of a roadmap leading up to it. So a specific diet, a media mm-hmm. diet, like things to watch to prepare yourself. And I'll never forget my wife and I were, we had two kids at the time, a, a toddler and an infant. And we were watching <laughs> some of the things that he had told us to watch beforehand. And we're laying in bed one night before bed. And she said like, what if you come back and you don't want to be married? And I was like, holy shit. Like I thought I've heard that, that before. Right. I thought that, but I wasn't about to like propose that to the conversation before I left. No, you don't want to pepper that in. Right, That's not a right, good idea. Exactly. But since she brought it up, I was honest about it. I said, I've thought about that too. And she paused for a minute and then she said, well, you know, if that's what's meant to be, that's what's meant to be, which is huge from, from her perspective. Huge. Huge. She wasn't like, don't go. I don't want to screw this up. Yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> I think that speaks to your partnerships, right? Like we've always been yeah. very supportive of each other. But so yeah. I went in um, nervous, of course. I had done psychedelics before in less intense and less structured environments. So I, I thought maybe I had a little bit of an idea of what was about to happen. But as as I'm sure you know, shaking your head there, like you don't know what's about to happen. And no. I don't know where you're going. So let's 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 riff on that a little bit. The the importance of having. I mean, listen, you, one of the most successful iconic beverage brands of all time, and I can only imagine the hours and the intensity where we're working. How how are you able to kind of, if you even could have parked that shit at the door when you came home and be present for your wife and your family during this time of growth, I, I was, and be the dad that you you weren't. I wasn't. I didn't do a good job of it. I would say until. And that's why I say it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I'm really happy mm. with who I am now and where I am, I love and the that. dad I am, and the and the husband I am, and the person in general. And I wouldn't be that person and all those things had this not happened to me. So I was doing a really bad job of it. I was, if I think back, I was caffeine in the morning, alcohol to decompress at night. I was, I didn't meditate. I was short tempered. I was, you know, harsh to everyone around. I was mm. not patient. And so that doesn't mean I was a bad person. That's just who I was at that time. And um. And so that was a lesson for me, right? I, very different, wow. which is why I, I enjoy my, you know, the the culture we've built at Koi so much is like life and work are no longer separate. They are ingrained. And and that's the reality anyways, whether you choose to face that or not, right? And whether you work as an entrepreneur or nine to five, it's almost right. always omnipresent. That's right. Yeah, it's about, it's about finding those. And, and listen, as we get older, and I think kids do that to you. And you don't want to have regrets, right? You want to be like, shit, I wish I was there more for you. I wish I was more present and not staring at my phone. I mean, even simple things in our house where we come home and really try to put our phones away, yeah. especially for dinner time. You know, simple simple actions like that. So let's get into the the Koya story. Uh, first and foremost, and I, and I told you this off air, they are delicious. And I'm not just saying that because you're sitting here on my show. Thank you. Um, they're really good. They're really One flavor I didn't like too much. Uh, I'll leave that out. But again, that's personal taste. And I think how many how many flavors are in the in the in the line? So we have 14 flavors in uh, in retail distribution. So like, let's say Whole Foods or wherever it may be. And then we just launched our three flavors on on Amazon. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, wow. I mean, it's a lot. And and, there, and and obviously flavor is subjective and personal. You're going to like it. But for the most part, I mean, I've tried similar products and a lot of them have this chalky kind of taste to it. Mm-hmm. Not with this. Yeah. And the one that hit me the most was was the coffee one because A, it's delicious. And B, it's got the caffeine kick in it. It's giving you the fiber, the protein, everything else, and you need it. How did this story, how did this come about? Did you help create the product or did you join an existing brand? So so go back to Fusion. There's this period of a few years where I'm kind of lost, right? I don't know who I really am. I'm not identifying with the company and the culture and my partners mm-hmm. and all that. And so I'm looking for outlets. And so those manifested themselves in like I, I did an Ironman, right? Physical out, outlets and then mental outlets. I was starting to invest in in products and companies. I was trying to find things I was aligned with. My life was evolving to be more health and wellness focused. And so I had a friend in Chicago call me and he said, hey, I know these two young entrepreneurs in Chicago. They have this drink called Raw Nature 5, which mm-hmm. essentially is Koya 1.0. I'll talk about that in a minute. And he said, you're a beverage guy. Would you take a look at it? And so I happened to be leaving my gym and in the front lobby of the gym, they have a little cafe and this product was there. So I grabbed one, I drank it, tasted phenomenal, as you mentioned. So I was really excited about, about how it tasted, which I think is really important when you're talking about a health product, right? Because I don't care how good something is supposed to be for you. If it doesn't taste good, you're not going to consume it. You're not going to want to drink it. You won't want to drink it, right? You, you may for a while because you feel like you have to, but 
Anyways, um, the uh, sorry here one sec. Right, it's it's all about the experience too. When you when you're consuming any health and wellness product, when like some of them really just taste like shit, they're packed full of stuff that you want. But there's that happy balance, right? There's that happy balance of finding what you like, what you don't like, and ensuring it's also the quality. And what are those benefits for you? That's that, exactly it. And so so I ended up tasting this product, and I said this tastes phenomenal, but there's no chance the macros are what they say they are, right? And so I got it tested, and that was true, and it wasn't their fault. It was a uh, uh, test kitchen formula. They were self-distributing, but I was like, I'll invest in this brand. And so that was my kind of intro to my partners at, at Koya, what would become Koya. Fast forward a few months later, the, ver the company's on the verge of insolvency. It's out of money. I had been called by this uh, advisor to that company asking if I would come and be CEO of that company. And I said, I I'm not a CEO for hire. I create my own companies and beverages. Uh, a few months later, it becomes clear there's an opportunity. I can come in and fund this mm. thing. I, I met with my two new partners and said, look, I'm 100% in control. We're going to evolve this thing to be scalable. I love this idea of plant-based. My second son was born dairy intolerant. We became a plant-based household mm. or a dairy-free household. And so that was really the inception of me with Koya, which was called Raw Nature Vibe at the time. We pulled the product off the market. We reformulated it to be scalable. We rebranded it to be Koya, and then we launched it. I love I love that story too, and and the receptiveness of those co-founders who knew what you were bringing to the table, and not just from a business experience. I mean, listen, you you scaled the shit out of an incredible product there, but you you knew the supply, you knew everything that went in manufacturing, supply chain, regulation, logistics. But the fact that you truly believed in the product yeah. and how important that was, you weren't just coming in for a financial opportunity, but you believed in them and you believed in the product. What was it about them, the two of them, that you saw? Like that, they had that fire and they had it, that, that, that certain, you know, je ne sais quoi, as they say. Yeah. The one thing I told them early on and, and I, I told them to keep is I said, you guys have this knack and ability to get people to like you and want to help you. And I was like, hmm. don't lose that because it's, it's so valuable, right? Where they should not have gotten opportunities to meet with a key broker in the space or meet with Whole Foods. They were able to do that. And it was just because they were likable people that people wanted to help. And in those early days, you need help. You can't do this stuff on your own. Hmm. People like working with people that they like. Yes, yeah, exactly. People don't like working with assholes unless you're fucking like, shit, there's the, there's the only guy or gal that I got to work with. It's the only person that's going to get what I need. I don't really like them. But obviously you want, you want, you want that likability factor. So I know almost everyone I know that's achieved any level of success has a no assholes policy. So you deal oh, yeah. with assholes when you have to. And then once you're able not to, it's just, it's the, it's a vetting, uh, you know, a gating discussion. If I like you, we can, we can have a conversation. If I don't, it's not worth talking. What was like the kind of that first save moment where you're like, thank God I'm here. Otherwise I would have saved you guys from disaster. Like, like, you know, you're, you're like that veteran, you know, starting pitcher coming in, right? You're the Verlander, Scherzer coming in. Right. For this for this team. Yeah. And you, and you saved it. The, the biggest two things I would say early on is one, uh, because it was a test kitchen formula. Right. Uh, consistency is not always there. And coming off of what I just come off with with Four Loco, I was really worried about putting any product out there that could be be perceived as harming somebody. Hmm. So I said, we have to pull this product off the market until it's, you know, scalable and tested and proven. Right. And so we did that. We, we, it was a tough decision. I mean, we didn't have any revenue coming in sure. for six months. We were burning cash. That was number one. Number two was when we did our first production run, um, some portion of the product was showing signs of early spoilage. It didn't taste good, right? And so the, the question was like, there's only limited money. Do we just put this out and take our chances that 10 or only 20% of it are, are spoiled? Or do we not? It's tough for a brand. Totally. And not putting it out meant we were risking our Whole Foods launch, right? But it, it sounds like this long discussion, it was within seconds. It was like, we can't put it out there. We can't. It's just not the right thing to do. And you just can't risk anybody's first exposure to your product being a bad one. That's such, that's such, just, could you pull back the curtain for a minute there? Like, do people really understand? Like, like let's give some perspective here. How, how do you like give us a sense of volume for one skew, how it's made, the volume, how it's made, like real quick, high level. So people understand what quality control really means from a batch production perspective okay, when so it comes when, to like a national we went, beverage. When we went into more official production, not in a, you know, not in a test. Right. And you're talking about 6,000 gallons of batch. Right. And so when you're starting out, you're usually doing the minimum of everything, which makes sense. So 6,000 gallons would roughly translate to 6,000 cases of product. We're planning on sending those to our distributor, which is how we're going to get paid. So most of our money is tied up in, in that inventory. Now, 
the, I guess the other thing that we did that I would say brought to the table was we ordered enough of our, of our raw materials, our ingredients for our first and second run. And so mm-hmm. when we, when we spoiled off that first one and destroyed it, we had enough to make enough. You're ready to go immediately. Right. You hedged it, which is not, which is not common, but it's, it's a big deal. I mean, if you think of 6,000 cases, call it, I mean, it's, you know, maybe 70, a hundred thousand dollars, you know, it, it's relevant. Yeah. And it's a lot of physical product and it go, a lot goes into that. Just, that's just one. Right. I and mean, you don't even think about the packaging, the manufacturing plan. You were probably working with a co-packer, right? There's a lot that goes, you know, into it as well there too. So let's, let's fast forward now. Um, what, what did like, what, what did you take from, from, uh, from four loco to accelerate the growth of Koya? So the, the number one, um, kind of key component to a success of a beverage in my eyes is liquid to lips. You have to get people to taste the product. And if they like it, they will buy it. And I remember early in my beverage career, somebody saying like, if you have a good product, give it away for free. And that made no sense to me, right? How, how am I going to get away for free? Hmm. The point was we made sure that that product was available on the shelves of every store was authorized in, and we were sampling like crazy to get liquid to lips. Mm-hmm. And if that doesn't work, which happened to us at Fusion, it wasn't working, you know, you got to evolve the beverage or the product, right? If it's working, you can double down, you can start to see repeat sales and and so getting the product in people's hands or liquid to lips is, is imperative. The second thing I would say is you have to be aggressive at, at retail. So, you know, a lot of times people get the word in our case that you get approval from Whole Foods and they're like clapping, you know, hand, uh, you know, washing their hands, job done. That's just the beginning of the work. You got to go in and make sure that stuff is on the shelf. You got to try to get expanded space. You got to ask the store for, for favors. Can I get secondary points of distribution? And so you know, recognizing that the work is only starting at the approval is, is really imperative as well. I don't think anyone understands the battle for, for shelf positioning. I don't think anyone really understands when you, when you go into a supermarket, the average consumer takes it for granted, but there is a battle. There are rebates. There's pricing built into it of where the eye line is, how much, how much, how, I don't know what the proper term is, how much width you get girth yeah. on the shelf. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. There's, there's how many skews you could put in there. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. And I don't think, think people about, really understand. When you think about markets, you think about New York City. I know you're in New York. Like that is the ultimate battleground because those mm. bodegas can look different minute to minute. If I'm in there one minute, I may arrange that shelf one way. The minute I leave, somebody else is in there and they rearrange it. So it's- They're moving your shit. It's a battle, <laughs> man. <laughs> I, I saw that. I saw that. It's so crazy. I mean, it's you're triggering like memories that I had when I used to go on on the on the runs with big guys or the vit- you know the vitamin yeah. water distributor guys. And we it was like New York City, like you know, 20 years ago. People were moving. They're like, just Adam, uh, move a uh, move a uh, you know uh, move that gator in and move it uh, you know move it over there. No one's gonna know. You know, it's like and it's real. It's like hand to hand combat it it in is. in some regards. It is. And that's that's crazy. So what what's what's the next what's the next big. Uh, boulder that you're you're pushing up the hill with with koya what's next on the horizon so for eight years now we've been a refrigerated protein beverage right what, mm. what we learned over the years is to test the boundaries of what koya stood for and so you know at its core it's delicious it's plant protein it's low sugar and we extended on that we went into these refrigerated smoothies that were lower in sugar we went into functional coffees we ultimately retracted back to and i say retracted it's it's a huge addressable market but to the idea that we are about plant protein and mm. so we've grown in retail. We're about in about 30,000 stores across the country. You mentioned Starbucks wow. at the beginning. Great, great partner, great awareness. But that market is going to, it's, it's pretty saturated from Koya's perspective. There's always more items we can get on the shelf. There's always more sizes we can do, things like that. But we were trying to figure out how are we really going to move the company to the next level? And so how we did that is by listening to consumer insights, right? So our number one question we got was, how do I buy this stuff in bulk? Because you got to think about the fact we're selling over 2 million bottles a month, one bottle at a time. I was about to say the margins on that. I mean, I don't, they're probably not as good as I think, right? Because when you get there, but like, but that's one at a time versus people want to buy 12, 24, 36 at a time. Exactly. So you think about that, a $4 ring versus a $40 ring, right? It's a big, it's a big difference in the number of transactions. The nice thing for us is we have 2 million plus transactions happening a month. People are choosing Koi. There's a lot of brand awareness, right? But the number one request is how do I buy in bulk? The number two request was, how do I get it delivered to my house? Well, as it sat as of last week, the only option was a refrigerated beverage, which yeah. is not really good for e-com because it has to be cold and it's heavy, right? It's yeah. costly to keep and, and ship a refrigerated item. Exactly. And so we didn't really have any e-com options. 
So the point is what we did is evolve it. We just launched our shelf stable nutrition shakes and mm. tetra packs, these things, and they're available in 12 packs on Amazon. So that's a huge move, right? It opens Boom. up and really solidifies us as a plant protein player. There's more innovation coming. There's more things happening. Um, I'm not going to talk about now, but the point is yeah. evolving kind of the platform. And so that's the next big, big uh, opportunity with Koya. I love it. So let's, let's get into the book. Was it, was it, was the name, did it, like, was that the only name you ever had? <laughs> like it had, like, like, yeah. like when I came up with my show, it was always a podcast. My last name is Poser. My nickname was Pause. It was a podcast. I never even thought of anything else. Yeah. I, I think it was pretty quick. Uh, and clear. always blackout punch. It was blackout punch. And, and there were a couple of things that did change, right? My original thought was it was going to look like a four loco can. It was going to have the camo pattern. It was going to be very recognizable. <laughs> and the, the vision was always, if you walked in an airport and you saw it in that window, right. you knew that was something with four loco. As I, huh. as I wrote the book and it took me four years to kind of fin finish this book, right? It, it evolved and changed over time. What I realized is that's not the four loco story. This is my story. And four loco is a that's part of my story, right? And, and a chapter in that, your story. Yeah, I say that because I'd even, you know, aligned with my uh, with my partners, and we said there's actually uh, in the works there's a documentary on Four Loco. That's the Four mm. Loco story. We'll all be a part of that story. This is my story, right? So the evolution away from the Four Loco canon look was was relevant. But Blackout Punch isn't just uh, talking about Four Loco. It's you know there are parts of my childhood that I blacked out, right? I I, I removed from my memory. Uh, punch is obviously the first flavor of four logo we came out with, but I grew up a fighter in more than one way. So it, it really resonated with me in multiple ways. And that's how the title became blackout punch. What did, what'd you learn about yourself in the process of writing this book? Man, uh, I learned to, to question my ego. You know, what was my motivation when I had been told multiple times throughout years, you should write a book and it was very casual. And I just always played it off as yeah, whatever. Who am I to write a book? Who, who gives a shit? When it really um, became a real project to me was in, in early 2020, I was talking to a friend who was sharing a story, difficult things she was going through. And I shared one of my stories. And afterwards, she said, man, you, you really should write a book that could help somebody. So my mission with launching the book was that I want one person to let me know that they read it and some story that was shared there helped them. And within a week of putting the book out, I had somebody text me and they said, man, I haven't talked to my dad for seven years. Uh, we, got, we battled with addiction. They said, I read the whole story about your mom and, and kind of what you did and really rethinking through, you know, how I approached this, that really helped. So check the box, success, right? Um, accomplished what I set out to. What's something in the book that maybe surprised your wife the first time she read it? Well, uh, nothing surprised her because she read it multiple times before I put it out. Uh, <laughs> well, even the first draft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was not going down that path. I'm not going to have her get yeah. surprised. Uh, Be like, what? I, how come you never told me? We, I would have signed up for this if I knew that, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm very candid even about yeah. things in our relationship in the book. So I made sure she was comfortable with that. Um, of course. Look, I mean, you know, one of the most difficult parts in the book to write about uh, and uh, speaking specifically to the relationship is the fact that uh, before we had children early in our marriage, I was unfaithful. And I, I think ayahuasca helped me understand that that was something that I just needed to come clean on. And never, it was, it was never something that was like this contentious moment that it came out. I just decided that I wanted to be honest with her and have the most honest relationship I've ever had in my life. And so that was not only tough to talk about, it was tough to write. And then it was really tough to put out in the world because I know that my kids are going to read this book one day, right? People we know and love are going to read this book. And it's a very vulnerable thing to share. Well, first and foremost, I, I applaud you for that vulnerability. And, and as I always say, like, and I say this to my wife too, I'm never going to bat a thousand. I'm not a 1000 hitter. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm human. I got my flaws. Like we're not, we're not, perfect we fuck up but right. we're good people and we have good intentions and we make mistakes and the last thing we ever want to do is hurt people that are closest to us mm -hmm. but that's kind of the case where we default as humans to hurting people that are closest to us right yeah i mean versus a complete or, stranger right intentionally or unintentionally like I, I think sometimes we can tell ourselves and this was my case we could tell ourselves story that stories that say well this isn't really hurting anybody or what's this really you know and and not if you're not able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and see the world from their perspective, you're going to be blind to the impact you have on them. Who's this book for? Who should pick it up? Um, you know, I think that I wrote this for the younger version of me. So, you know, I think it, 
there are plenty of things that apply. I think people that are uh, aspiring entrepreneurs may be interested. I think that uh, you know young men would be interested to learn from my mistakes, hopefully. I think that people that know any of the brands will be interested in the business stories of it, but uh, but that's who I wrote it for was the younger version. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna add that to to my to my summer reading list, and I got a couple a couple for you too, Chris. This is, this has been fantastic. I, I really enjoy our conversation. We could probably do this for for a few more hours, but I wanna I wanna bring it home here. What's uh what's keeping you up at night these days? You know, uh, I mentioned before the show I have three young sons, and um, <laughs> and it's and it's not it's not the answer you would think. It's not them because they won't sleep or whatever. Of it's, course, um, I, I've had the realization. You know, I. When I started as an entrepreneur, I wanted to take advantage of every opportunity, win every battle. You know, there was, I was worried that if I didn't, I would miss it. And mm. how would I know uh, through years of experiences that I will always be able to create and earn and grow things? What I won't ever be able to do again is have an 11 year old, a nine year old, and a six year old. And so what keeps me up at night is, man, did I show up in the best way possible for them today? What did I miss? What did I say that I saw an impact on my son's face and that he may have taken it the wrong way? Do I got to clean anything up? That's the thing that keeps me up at night. I had one of those moments yesterday. My my daughter's 12, my son is six. And so there's a six year difference between them. And my daughter's turning into a teenager and there's not going to be a lot more time left when she still wants to play with him, right? She's going to get into her own thing. And I was downstairs and sorting something in the laundry basement room area. And they were playing in the, the playroom right next to it. And I just heard them laughing and playing together. And I just kind of like, you know, stuck my I, And I just watched. And I had one of those, you know exactly what I'm talking about. One of those mm -hmm. moments you're like, I need to capture that in my head. I need to just hold on to this moment because that's what it's about. And I'm here for it. I'm here. I have the ability hey. as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, where at 4.30 in the afternoon, I can finish my day at home and not in my office here. And I can be there. And, and that's what it's about, right? It's, it's, it's about those moments. And I think that comes with maturity and experience. And obviously when you become a parent, it's like, I want to be the best fucking parent I could be. Absolutely. And I want to make a life where I could do that. So Chris, let's bring it home here. Um, this is my master class, and this certainly has been an epic one. I asked my guests these last two questions because it just books mark, but you know, it bookends the, the whole show here. Chris, Chris Hunter, what's, what's the single greatest piece of advice you ever received that you take action on daily, a mantra, something that you, you were, something that you just sticks in ingrained in your head to start your day. You are responsible for everything that happens in your life. So take responsibility and action, right? That, and the way I apply that is I'll use today as an example. I was, I was tired. I wasn't feeling hundred percent. I could easily just bitch about it and be sluggish. I jumped my ass in the ice bath and changed the day, right? Like you got, you got to take action and take responsibility and you may choose to have a shitty day. That's fine. But you mm. are responsible for how your life and every day and every moment turn out. You're a cold plunger. I am. <laughs> I've done it a couple of times. I, I do it in my swimming pool. It's not my cup of tea, but I, I respect the shit out of it. And I understand all the, you know, anti-inflammatory and the, the stress and all that too. I think I'm going to give it more of a try there. For, for me, um, it wipes the day clean. I get to start fresh. That's it's like a hard reset almost, right? A reset. Yep. Ah, uh, that's, that's good stuff too. So let's, let's bring it home here. Chris, I, I love your story. I love your journey, your vulnerability, and you've been through it, man. You've been through it since as a kid, your trials, your tribulations, your upbringing. And you think back to those moments in your early childhood. You think back to the moments with your mom battling an addiction and all that you had to go through with her. Building a company, the ups and downs, you know, breaking up the partnership. And you had to pull yourself up when you were at the bottom and you had to re reach down deep and harness that inner tenacity to pull yourself up and out. And now you sit here, this life, this family, this self-awareness of who you are and what you're building, this gratitude. What keeps you focused? What is your beacon? Chris Hunter, what is your North Star in life? Uh, I mean, what I'm aspiring to do in my life is live every moment of it. And so there's always more to learn. There's always more to experience. There's always more people to talk to. Um, and so I think what what keeps me going all the time is is there's always more for me to do. More to create, more to learn, more to see, more to experience. Amen to that. Amen to that. That is that is great. And uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. My audience thanks you. Uh, I want everyone to check out Koya at drinkkoya.com. You can follow them on Insta at drinkkoya. Where else could folks connect with you? Where could they learn more? Where could they get the book? Amazon, we're going to link it up. Yep. All the 
all the, the spots. Amazon, the, the new Koi drinks are on Amazon. You can find me on LinkedIn, Christopher Hunter. You can find me on Instagram, double underscore Christopher Hunter. Um, that's where I'm most active. Guys, try, try, I'm not even just, I'm not even just saying it cause he's my guest. Cause if I tried them and I didn't like them, this would be a half hour call, a <laughs> half hour podcast instead of 54 minutes here. They, they are good. They, they are really good. Definitely the coffee, the, uh, the banana chocolate, right? The banana chocolate one. Uh, yeah. yeah. My kids love that one. My, my daughter had the, the couple of them for breakfast for a couple of days in a row. If love you could it. get the kids to eat right. healthy instead of the shitty sugary cereal that's out there. Right. We're winning, right? Guys, kids, kids, this is good for the kids. Mix it up. Put it, put it, put it in the blender for the summer, right? Like mix it up, make it, make it a smoothie. Guys, check this one out. Chris, hang with me for one moment here. This has been fantastic. And folks out there, if this show resonated with you, leave a review rating goes a long way. You know where to find out more at the podcast.com. Follow us on all the social media channels. Remember guys, be good to yourself, be better to others and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.